At Christ Community Church, we believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Every generation plays an important role in building the kingdom of God in this community. So investing in our young people is important because they are our future leaders. We are equipping all ages and all backgrounds for the work of ministry, whether in the field or in the workplace, because God has called everyone to change the world. We believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was and is the eternal Son of God. At Christ Community Church, we are inspiring generations to be world changers for Christ. It is good to be here. And I, I have a sermon, but even as we were um, worshiping today, this theme has kept coming back. Like I had this thought earlier this week, and then Dina actually said something in a meeting earlier, and somebody else said a very similar, th I think it was Rose, said a very similar thing that kind of confirmed what I was thinking, but God is moving in the earth. And we are invited to be right in the center of it. Yeah. We have a front row seat to what the king of the universe wants to do in the nations. And I feel that there is this invitation to reawaken to that thing. Right. Like to, to get beyond just being Christians, even powerful Christians, but to get our eyes on him and what he is doing. Thanks. And so... The scripture came to mind during worship today. It's in Habakkuk. That's how I say it. If you say it differently, you probably know better than me. But chapter one, and what's going on is Habakkuk is seeing a bunch of things that he doesn't understand and he doesn't like and doesn't make sense. And he's kind of complaining to the Lord. And he says, how long, Lord? This is in verse two of chapter one. How long, Lord, must I call for help and you don't listen? Or cry out about violence and you don't save. Why, don't you, why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. And this is the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and observe and be utterly astounded. For I am about to do something in your days that you will not believe. Wow. What if we look past everything that's going on that is creating fear and chaos and darkness and injustice, things that even like common sense says, how can this be? And we look to him to know that something is coming. We may not see it. It may look like the tide is going in the opposite direction. But I believe that there are eyes of faith that can look through that thing and go, something's coming and I'm going to stand here until it hits. We are called to be people of faith. There is supposed to be a stability that comes when we look and lock eyes with the king. And when it comes, I want to be ready. I want to be standing there. I want to have done what I needed to have done. I want to be prepared the way I needed to be prepared so that when it comes, I hit the ground running. I can't be like, oh, shoot. I should have actually been listening to you all this time. All this time you were calling me to let that thing down. All this time you were calling me to understand your word. All this time you wanted me to understand your heart and your character and your goodness so that when something comes, whatever it may be, I am prepared to release it into the world. I can't be found asleep when he shows up. And there's something coming. It's coming. He is victorious. His enemies are already defeated. And so we get to be the people to represent that in the nations. 
We get to be the people to reflect Jesus. Not how the past has interpreted Jesus, but the authentic, real Jesus. And we're called, we're invited to be with him now. When everything looks dark and everything looks helpless, will we still lean in? Will we still lean in? Will we still sacrifice our time or our efforts to be with him and to be where he is and to do what he's doing even when it, sometimes it looks futile? Sometimes it looks like it's not doing anything. Will we continue to pray for our loved ones that we see no progress with? Because we know someday the answer's coming. Someday the vision will be fulfilled. Actually, I think that is as well in Habakkuk. Hold on one second. Two, two what, Pastor Mitch? There you go. Two, two, two. The Lord answered me and said, write down this vision. Clearly inscribe it on tablets so that one may easily read it. Ready? For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and it will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it since it will certainly come and not be late. Habakkuk wasn't even in my mind today when I got here. Listen, you need to read it. It's good stuff. There's, there's faith being built up in this room. There's faith being built up in the church. But we got to get our eyes on him. We need to look at him. We need to get aligned with him. He is it. Jesus is it. He's the only way this is going to work. And so you should be encouraged Don't grow weary in doing good, because at the appointed time, the vision will come to pass. Some of you, oh my goodness, Jessica, where are you at? Wave to me. Jessica had a dream that she shared with me today, and she said she had a dream that God was thawing things out, and she said, I believe that there are callings and things in people's lives that they've given up on that are frozen and put away, and he's thawing it out, and he's bringing it back to life. There are things the Lord is trying to awaken in you today. There are things that he is breathing life back upon. And you prayed for me today that the Elijah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel's bones would come back to life. My goodness, guys, keep talking to me before church. You're giving me so much good material. This is phenomenal. Don't look at the dry bones, but prophesy to the dry bones. God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the dry bones. You, there are some things in our lives we need to begin to prophesy to. That's right. And not like, oh God, I hope this happens and you come back to life. No, use authority. Yeah. That's right. Use the fact like you actually have the backing of heaven. Get God's heart and God's vision for the thing and then speak it and speak it and speak it until it comes back. All right. Is that it, Lord? Can I get to my sermon yet? We, how we doing? Come on. All right. So, were you guys here a couple weeks ago when I was here? I talked about the highway. By the way, I have never gotten a better response on a sermon than this highway sermon. I'm like, okay. It obviously resonated with some folks, which is, that's the point. Praise God. So, if you weren't here... I talked about like this highway, which is like the grace, the glory, the fullness of God's intention for your life, where you hit the highway, and it doesn't mean you don't have problems, it doesn't mean there aren't things you need breakthrough for, but nonetheless, you're moving with the Lord, yeah? And I talked about two ditches, one on the left, one on the right, and one was self-righteousness, as in, I got this. I don't necessarily need Jesus for everything. Um, Some people, they don't even think they need him for salvation or heaven. 
completely incorrect. You need forgiven, whether you go to the church or not. We all need forgiven. We all come to the cross on the level ground. Every person needs forgiveness. And, but even in life, we're like, I got this, Lord. Like, I'll come to you when I really need some help. And, and it creates compromise, it creates self-effort, and it doesn't, it doesn't bring fulfillment because only Jesus can bring fulfillment or the max out of anything we do, huh? Okay, so then on the other side is the, that feeling of unworthiness of God giving up on you. If you show up at church, he's going to throw a lightning bolt. I've heard that from lots of people. Like this, God doesn't really want me because I'm too screwed up. I'm too messed up, I, I haven't done enough, I'm not enough to walk in the fullness. But in the middle, you have this place where Jesus qualifies me to be enough, and I am aware that without him I have nothing, and it creates this highway of humility, because without him, I can't do it, and without him, I can't do it, he's it. And when you get to that place where it's just him, you hit it running. And as I was praying and thinking about this sermon, it occurred to me that both are pride. That's right. Both ditches are pride. The one seems a little more obvious than the other, but the one is like, hey, I got this, Jesus. I'll talk to you when I need a hand with something. Thanks. Pride. You're, you're like, I, I can do this. I don't need him involved in this relationship or this decision or this business or this. I've got this. I'll include you on the things I'd like to. Pride. Pretty self-explanatory. But it's also pride to go, I'm too bad for you to get me out of this ditch to make me righteous and holy and something of power in the earth. Because both, both rely on ourselves. This is, I've got this, I'm good. The other is, I'm too bad. It's all about me and what I can do. And I think that's bigger than what you can do, so I'm just going to stay here. Both, I'm the focus. But in the middle, he rescues me, he pulls me up, and it's him. It's a life that is set in trusting him, his ability, his grace, his power, his wisdom, his intelligence, his knowledge, him, 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 him. And if he, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians, like he is our wisdom and our knowledge and our righteousness, he is it. And he's the king, and he never loses, then all of a sudden, I've got a momentum that I cannot have in this ditch or this ditch because my momentum is super, super limited. Making sense? So, it says in James chapter 4 that, my water here, yeah. He gives, <clears throat> excuse me, he gives more grace Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That middle ground where you're like, I need you for everything, and I have you for everything, creates this place of humility, which causes grace to come pouring out. Unhindered grace, because I'm not looking to myself I'm looking at him. And so it creates a boldness with humility. I think boldness with humility is like the sweet spot. Because, and I'll, be, I'll use an example as of right now. I have no business standing on this stage talking to you. I'm a kid from 84 Pennsylvania, which most of you have never heard of before. I used to be incredibly shy. I hated public speaking. I was a nominal Christian at best. You know, I, I'm, perfection is light years away from me. There are things about me that I don't like, and I'm like, I have no business standing on this stage. But on the other hand, Jesus is my righteousness. He's called me, he's anointed me, and he told me to stand here so I can stand. And the thing is, I... 
I can't get prideful about it because I recognize he's the one that put me here. So have I ever shared the story, I'm sure I have, about the youth group? Most of my kids have heard about the youth group where God pulled his hand off me for 30 seconds. Give me a wave if you don't know the story. Okay, good, 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 good. This is literally one of the most impactful moments of my entire life. Um, a friend of mine used to have a youth group in East Stroudsburg, PA. And he called me up and he said, hey, you want to come preach to my youth group? I said, absolutely, let's do it. I go out there. I had been there before and I'm preaching this message and it was good. Man, I felt it. I'm supposed to laugh, but nonetheless, it's fine. <laughs> it was good, honestly. And uh, in the middle of preaching, I felt God take his hand off me. Felt it physically. Like I kept talking but words just dropped. Like, I, it was still making sense, but I'm like, what the heck is happening? It's so much, like, I'm having a panic attack on the inside while I'm preaching because I'm like, God left. Like, he is not on this at all. And after, we'll say, a minute or so, probably 30, it, it was probably more like 30 seconds, but nonetheless, it, it hit back in. It was like, Whoa. and I said out loud, so they have no idea what's going on. I went, there it is. And they were probably like, what does that mean? But to me, I'm like, thank God you came back. <laughs> so, so I'm driving back to State College from, from East Stroudsburg. And I hit the highway and I'm like, what was that? Like, don't you ever do that to me again? <laughs> like, like you, you told me to do this. You can't be messing with me like that, Lord. Like, what was that? And he said, I need you to know that it's me. And anything I ever do through you, I'm the source of it. You're not. And I have to tell you, it has stripped me down that any time I get to do something like this, I come up here aware fully. You put me here. You're going to carry me through it. And you alone. People are like, oh, you're a pretty humble guy. Yeah, because I know it's not me. Because I am well aware that if I want to get arrogant and cocky about it, he can do what he did to me in East Stroudsburg, and I can't do that. It's terrifying. And he hasn't done it to me again, and I pray he never has to remind me. I'll just remain humble, then he won't have to humble me. Life will be good. And so the cool thing about that is, not only am I like super well aware that it's his grace and his grace alone, it also causes me to live more boldly because it's him and not me. I can actually stand on a stage in front of a couple hundred people and online and not be, not fall apart because I'm like, you put me here, you called me, you've equipped me, you'll take care of it. And so I can actually trust that you'll actually get something out of my sermon because he put me here. Not because I'm so wise or I'm a biblical scholar, which I'm not. Any of those things. It's him. Jesus is it. And so there is a boldness with a humility. And I feel like it is a sweet spot that you can be bold. It says the righteous are as bold as a lion. If you're lacking in boldness, I challenge you, get a fresh vision of who you are and who's in your corner. Who's actually moving through you. It says, I believe in 2 Corinthians, that we are jars of clay, broken vessels that the Lord fills. And because of that, my brokenness, my limitations don't disqualify me for doing great things for God. And so your brokenness does not disqualify you from doing great things for God. You can bring it to him. He already knows. He can go, God, I'm struggling here. God, I don't have this all together yet. God, I really need help. But I know that you don't use me because of my perfection. You use me because of your love for people. And because of that, I can step out in boldness, in faith, and believe you're going to fill my mouth, or you're going to fill my hands with power, or you're going to give me the words that need to be spoken to break things off of people. The kingdom can advance through me even though I'm not perfect. The kingdom can flow through you even though you're not perfect. 
And when we realize that he is our qualification, we're going to attempt more. Because when we recognize like from the beginning that God is on the move, there are things happening in the earth and I want to be a part of it. And if I'm going to wait till I'm perfect to get my feet in the water, I'm never getting in. But if I can keep my eyes on him and his strength and his ability, then I can attempt crazy stuff. Why not? The limits are off because of him, not because of me. And so, by the way, I didn't even realize we were doing a serving thing, like, hey, join the ushers. I had no idea, so don't think, like, oh, he set me up. I didn't. I just, I'm just preaching. There is a something about when you recognize that God is moving and you have something to contribute that you will automatically involve yourself in something. Because there's something inside of you that the world needs that God put there. And if you hang out with him long enough, that thing is going to burst. Wow. You need an outlet of your anointing. Wow. The world needs an outlet of your anointing. What you carry, the world needs. What you carry, your family needs. What you carry, this church needs, this community needs, this nation needs, this planet needs. So what do you carry that the Lord is stirring to pull it out? The more you find out who you are and who's in your corner, that thing is going to find its path out. And maybe some of you, you just need to sign up for something. Like Pastor Mitch said, listen, I tried every ministry known to man before I figured out what I was good at. I realized super quick, I'm not called the preschool ministry. I did preschool ministry for my first semester in Pensacola, and I was like, this is fun, but no. No. I I don't do diapers. I don't wipe noses. I'm like, you want to play ball? Let's go kick a soccer ball. But that's about the limit of my preschool ministry. Um, I did all kinds of things. And I'm like, not good at that. Don't like that. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? I got favor with youth. I like kids. A lot of people don't like teenagers. I love them. This is great. And I got to be a youth pastor for a long time. Now I get to hang out with young adults who I love and adore and preach to you, which I love. I'm 45. This was a journey. I started when I was like 20. Yeah, I know. I'm getting old. (laughs) But um, scrolling down, I'm going to skip the middle verse that I had, but for the second or the last one, talking about Jesus Knowing who he was, can we have that John, John chapter uh, 13? I have it. Oh, it's up. Okay. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Don't move it yet, please. Look at, read that. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands... And that he had come from God and was going back to God. Jesus knows his identity in this time, in this season. Jesus is like, hey, the Father has given me all things. And I've come from him and I'm going back to him. So he has an awareness of his situation, of who he is, who's got his back, where he's come from, where he's going, what he has in authority. And because of this, next verse... He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. When you know who you are, service becomes a natural outflow. And the other thing is, no service is beneath you. Because the king of the universe got down on his hands and knees and washed his disciples' cruddy feet. He didn't go, hey, do you know who I am? Do you know? You should be washing my feet. He said, no, I'm so aware of who I am that doing the most demeaning task does not dent my ego or anything because it's not found in what I do. It's found in who I am. 
It's not found in what I do. It's found in the one who calls me and gives me my identity because he's given me all things and I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going so I can do this and I can do it anointed and I can do it proudly and and with heart and love and service because my identity is not that. My identity is in him. So you can serve. To the lowest, you can serve to the highest. So I had, I had a, God gave me a practical example of this a few years ago. So I am a person, and you can actually, you can ask the Watkins family. I have a very, like I gag easily. I, I, I'm, it's amazing the easiness with which I'll be like, uh, you know, like <laughs> it's crazy. So God gave me a, oh, I'll back this up. I'll back it up. Keep, keep the gag thing going though. Like remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, I have a buddy. Uh, he's currently in Columbus and he called me up one day. This is years ago. Cause bro, I have a word for you. I don't know how to tell you cause it doesn't make any sense, but I really feel the Lord on it. I said, just say it. I'll, I'll figure it out. He says, God says there's glory and clean in toilets. I said, I have no idea what that means. But okay, you know, I think at that time I was laying hardwood floors. I'm a youth pastor. I'm like cleaning toilet. I clean my toilet, but no glory in that. So anyway, years later, I spent my summer in state college between my second and third year. And I worked for my buddy, Mike Wingard, who owns a cleaning company. And he said, listen, we do this thing called turnover, which I had never heard of. Even living here, I had never heard of turnover. He goes, where we clean as many college kids' apartments as we can in a three-week period to go from the old people moving out to the new people moving in. So you got to clean as fast as you can. And I'm like, he goes, it pays well. It's not the greatest. I'm like, I need money. I'm going back to California. Okay. College students, please clean your bathrooms. What the heck? <laughs> like, like take, take a Lysol wipe and go like that one time. One, one time every two months, you might be good. I cleaned toilets that hadn't been touched in nine months. I mean, I'm on my hands and my knees, scrubbing like behind the toilet. And then the worst was, you know those, those bristly toilet brushes? Well, they tend to flick. (laughs) So I'm on my hands and my knees, scrubbing a toilet, and I'm like, how did I get here? I had a good job like two years ago. Jesus tells me to go to California, and now I'm hanging on a toilet. And I went like this, and it went flick. (laughs) And I'm like, like, God, what is happening? And then all of a sudden, there's glory in scrubbing toilets. And I went, you know what? I am not above scrubbing somebody's toilet. I'm not too good for this. This is how Jesus has decided to provide for me in this moment. And I would prefer not to get flicked in the face anymore, but I will clean and I will do a good job and I will make sure that thing looks like it did when the college student moved in nine months ago. And it was like, it was just, just this check. Like, there's nothing beneath you, Jim. You're not too good for anything. You're a servant. And your identity is my child. And my children don't run away from the hard things. They dive in when I call them because that's who they're called to be. And so I could boldly scrub toilets. It was very humbling. But I'm like... You know, after a while, you're like, okay, I get it. You know, you figure out what works, what doesn't work. And it's so hitting this place of humility and boldness releases service. It releases who you're called to be to the world. It releases who God has made you to be. And I, to be honest with you, after I got the like, hey, there's glory in scrubbing toilets, I actually was like, I'm kind of glad I get to scrub toilets. Like, I felt glory on it. I felt almost a, 
What? Oh, somebody sneezed. I thought they were trying to give me a word. Um, <laughs> I, almost, I felt almost, almost an honor in it. Like, I am representing God as I do this. And that's cool. I'm super glad it ended. Like, I'm not going to lie. I was glad when the summer was over, but it was good. Um, yeah. And so, it says that the greatest are the servants. And I think it all starts with identity. We know who we are. We know what he's put in our hands. We know where we're from. We know where we're going. And then we just get to walk. And sometimes you get to stand on a stage in a nice new shirt. And this is a new shirt. (laughs) Or sometimes you scrub toilets. And either way, I'm still a son. I'm still valued. I'm still called. I'm still anointed. I'm just walking through different seasons. So there's freedom. There's freedom to be humble and yet bold. And to serve high and serve low. Because I'm wrapped up in who he is and who he's called me to be. And it, it's a highway. It, you find a stride that you cannot find any other way in it. So I'm going to pray. Pastor Mitch is going to come up. Jesus, Lord, I thank you for the greatness that is inside of each and every person that can hear my voice. That there is glory. That there is weight to who you've made them to be. And I ask that you would reveal yourself to them in a new way. That God, you would pull them out of the left pit of compromise and God, I'll invite you in when I need you. And that you'll pull them out of the right pit of, I'm just not good enough. He could never use me. And you'll put them in that center spot of humble boldness. And that God, it would unlock them so that they can be front and center in what you're doing in the nations. That Lord, this church would be a people who carry your presence, who carry your power, who see heaven come to earth in church and in our homes and in our businesses and on the streets, that God, the kingdom of heaven would flow through us on a regular basis, but Lord, it would have no ability to cause us to be prideful because it's you. You're the source. Let us be a humbly bold people and see the nations Be in awe of what you want to do as your visions that you've given us come to pass. In Jesus' name, amen.